Did you know that one in eight Americans struggles with food insecurity? That's about 34 million people, including 9 million children. In this video, we're going to explore the food assistance programs in the United States, how they work to address this staggering issue, and where they fall short. There's a lot to consider, so let's get to it. Prior to the 1930s, food assistance in the United States was primarily provided by private charities and religious organizations. Limited government intervention meant that churches, community groups, and settlement houses were the primary providers of food assistance, usually taking the form of soup kitchens and bread lines. But such efforts were often inconsistent and limited in scope, largely dependent on local resources and volunteer efforts. The Great Depression highlighted the inadequacy of these efforts in addressing widespread hunger and poverty and spurring the federal government to take a more active role across all areas of economic and social life, including in ensuring food security. Remember that the Great Depression was a truly unprecedented economic and social upheaval. At its peak, the unemployment rate in the country reached about 25%, with unemployment in some sectors like construction exceeding 75%. As unemployment rose, incomes collapsed. After all, there was no unemployment insurance at the time. As a result, millions of Americans struggled to afford adequate food. By 1933, about 15% of all households were estimated to have inadequate diets, and malnutrition-related diseases like rickets and pellagra saw a resurgence, especially among vulnerable populations like children, the elderly, and the sick. As a result, as part of the New Deal program that introduced a variety of social safety programs, including unemployment insurance and social security retirement, the Roosevelt administration also began several food security initiatives. In 1933, it established the Federal Surplus Relief Corporation, which redistributed excess agricultural commodities to the needy. This program served a dual purpose, supporting farmers by purchasing their surplus agricultural products, which were depressing farm prices and incomes, while simultaneously providing food to those in need. A few years later, in 1939, the first food stamp program was created. Originally established as an experimental program, it allowed low-income individuals to purchase government-issued orange stamps to supplement their normal food expenditures. For every $1 worth of orange stamps purchased, 50 cents worth of blue stamps were also issued. Orange stamps could be used to buy any food. Blue stamps could only be used to buy food determined by the Department of Agriculture to be surplus. The program was discontinued in 1943 as economic conditions improved and unemployment decreased due to the war. In 1946, the National School Lunch Act was passed. The act was motivated by concerns that malnutrition among young men eligible for the draft during World War II had prevented some from serving, undermining national security. As a result, to ensure a ready supply of fit young men for military service, and to relieve the problem of surplus agricultural production, the legislation introduced nutritional guidelines for school lunches and provided free or reduced price lunches to children from low-income families. The program relied heavily on surplus commodities, leading to menus featuring canned fruits, vegetables, and meats, but nevertheless ensuring access to food and improving the nutrition of young Americans. But for our purposes, it was the Food Stamp Act of 1964, which made the food stamp program permanent, that is most relevant. The program, like its predecessor, required participants to purchase food stamps, but it significantly expanded the program, making it permanent, broadening and standardizing eligibility across the states, and eliminating the concept of special stamps for surplus food. Instead, the program aimed to support American agriculture and improve the diets of low-income households by ensuring regular access to healthy foods. In the 1970s, the program was expanded and the purchase requirement was eliminated, making it more accessible to poorer Americans. In 1966, the Child Nutrition Act expanded the National School Lunch Program and created a pilot school breakfast program. Interestingly, the movement to expand and make permanent the program, which culminated in 1975, was partially the result of the Black Panther Party's Free Breakfast for School Children program, which we explore in another video. In 1972, the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, commonly referred to as WIC, was established as a pilot program. 
the program, which provides nutritional support for low-income pregnant women, new mothers, and young children, was made permanent two years later. The 1980s and 1990s saw both expansion and attempts at reform of these programs. There were increased efforts to reduce fraud and limit the growth in programs, while also ensuring that benefits were reaching those most in need. Funding for food assistance programs was cut in the early 1980s, and eligibility requirements were tightened, with changes ostensibly aimed at reducing reliance on government assistance and encouraging self-sufficiency. However, program changes also led to increasing hardship for many low-income families. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996 represented perhaps the culmination of this trend. The Act, sometimes simply referred to as the Welfare Reform Act, placed new restrictions on food stamp eligibility for certain groups. The Act established work requirements to receive benefits, requiring individuals to work or participate in work-related activities for at least 20 hours per week to be eligible for benefits. It also established federal lifetime limits on benefits and permitted states to establish even stricter limits and it established stricter eligibility requirements, limiting the ability of immigrants and college students to receive benefits and denying new benefits to children born to families already receiving benefits. The Farm Security and Rural Investment Act of 2002 reversed some of these restrictions and included provisions to increase food stamp benefits and expand benefit eligibility, especially for working families and the elderly. In 2008, the Food Stamp Program was renamed the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, to reduce the stigma and emphasize the nutritional aspect of the program. The shift to electronic benefit transfer EBT cards in the late 1990s and early 2000s transitioned SNAP benefits from paper coupons to electronic cards, streamlining the program, improving efficiency, and reducing fraud, while further reducing the stigma sometimes associated with receiving benefits. Two years later, the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act reauthorized and strengthened child nutrition programs, including the National School Lunch Program and the School Breakfast Program. The act also emphasized the need to improve nutritional quality of school meals, to reduce childhood obesity, and to expand access to food assistance for children in need. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the school nutrition programs were expanded. Free meals were made universal, and all students, regardless of family income, were eligible. Greater flexibility was introduced into the program, permitting schools to provide grab-and-go meals, deliver meals to students' homes, and serve meals outside of traditional group settings and mealtimes. And the programs were expanded into the summer months, ensuring year-round access to breakfast and lunch. However, in most states, these changes were temporary and ended when the emergency COVID funding dried up. However, some states, like California, have continued to provide funding to maintain the universal free school meals, reducing the stigma associated with the free school meals program, and ensuring that all students have access to nutritious food regardless of family income. The current public feeding and nutrition assistance infrastructure in the United States consists of several primary programs and several other smaller programs designed to combat hunger and improve nutrition among various populations, including low-income families, children, seniors, and other vulnerable groups. The largest program is SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This program, which is the modern incarnation of the food stamp program, provides electronic benefits that can be used at authorized retailers to purchase most food items, including fruits, vegetables, meat, dairy, and bread, but notably excluding pre-prepared hot meals in most states. SNAP eligibility is determined based on income, household size, and other factors. Individuals receiving SNAP benefits are generally required to work. SNAP serves about 41 million people across the United States every month. It has an annual budget of about $70 billion, making it the single largest nutrition assistance program in the country. While benefits vary based on family size, location, and other factors, the average monthly benefit is about $154 per person in 2023. The Special Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program for Women, Infant, and Children, which is also sometimes called WIC, targets low-income pregnant women, new mothers, infants, and children up to five years of age. The program provides nutrition education, healthcare referrals, and vouchers for specific nutritious foods like infant formula, milk, eggs, cheese, fruits, and vegetables. It also includes breastfeeding support and education. WIC is funded through federal grants to the states and is intended to improve birth outcomes, reduce infant mortality rates, and promote healthy growth and development in young children. 
Eligibility for WIC is determined by income, nutritional risk, and residency, with participants required to meet specific state residency requirements. The monthly value of the WIC food packages can vary, but generally range from about $40 to $100 per person. In 2023, WIC served about 6.2 million people monthly and had an annual budget of about $5 billion. WIC has been shown to improve birth outcomes, reduce infant mortality, and promote healthy growth and development in young children. The National School Lunch Program provides nutritionally balanced, low-cost, or free lunches to children in public and nonprofit private schools in order to ensure that children have access to nutritious meals which can improve their health, academic performance, and overall well-being. Free lunches are available to children from families with incomes at or below 130% of the federal poverty level, and reduced price lunches are available to children from families with incomes between 130 and 185% of the federal poverty level. For a family of four, this translates to a household income of about $40,000 per year for the free program, or about $58,000 per year for the reduced price program. The program works by providing schools with subsidies and commodity foods from the USDA for each meal served. Meals must meet federal nutrition standards, including specific requirements for calories, fruits and vegetables, grains, and protein. In 2023, the NSLP served just under 30 million children daily across 95,000 schools and child care institutions. The program has an annual budget of about $14 billion, reimbursing schools at a maximum rate of $3.66 per meal. As previously mentioned, the NSLP was made universal during the COVID pandemic, ensuring that all children had access to school lunches regardless of family income. However, as funding for that program dried up, most states have moved back to the more restrictive model, with the notable exceptions of California, Maine, and Massachusetts, which passed laws implementing universal meal programs, and a handful of other states, including Colorado, Minnesota, New Mexico, and Vermont, which provided temporary funding to extend the program. The National School Breakfast Program aims to ensure that children start the day with a nutritious meal. The program works in a similar manner to the NSLP in terms of eligibility and benefits levels, reimbursing schools a maximum of $2.39 per meal. The SBP reaches about 14.7 million children daily on its annual budget of $4.5 billion. The Child and Adult Care Program, the CACFP, provides meals and snacks to children and adults in child care centers, after-school programs, family daycare homes, and adult daycare centers. As with the school meals program, participating facilities in the CACFP receive reimbursements for meals and snacks served to eligible participants that meet specified nutritional guidelines, with reimbursement rates varying based on the type of provider, the age of the participant, and the income level of the area. The program's annual budget is about $3.5 billion, and it reaches about 4.5 million children and about 130,000 adults daily. There are a variety of smaller, more targeted programs with correspondingly smaller budgets that also provide nutritional assistance. The Emergency Food Assistance Program provides USDA foods to states for distribution to low-income households through emergency food providers like soup kitchens, food banks, and pantries, or as part of disaster relief initiatives. The program reaches millions of individuals annually, though the precise numbers vary based on demand and funding levels. The annual budget for the program is about $400 million, though this is sometimes increased through emergency appropriations during times of increased needs, for example, following natural disasters. The Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program provides low-income seniors with coupons that can be exchanged for eligible foods, including fruits, vegetables, honey, and herbs, at participating farmers markets, roadside stands, and community-supported agriculture, or CSA, programs. This program has an annual budget of about $20 million and reaches about 800,000 low-income seniors annually. The Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations provides the USDA foods to low-income households living on Indian reservations or in other approved areas. The program serves approximately half of the 584 federally recognized tribes in the United States, reaching between 50 and 75,000 people annually. It has an annual budget of about $78 million. The Commodity Supplemental Food Program provides monthly food packages to low-income seniors, supplementing their diets with nutrient-dense USDA foods that includes fruits, vegetables, grains, and protein. The program serves about 700,000 low-income seniors on an annual budget of about $250 million. 
and the Special Milk Program provides milk to children in schools, child care institutions, and eligible camps that do not participate in other federal meal service programs with the goal of encouraging milk consumption and improving child nutrition. In 2023, the program served approximately 50 million half pints of milk to children on an annual budget of about $10 million. These programs collectively represent a significant investment in the health and well-being of Americans, particularly children in low-income families. They play a crucial role in reducing food insecurity, improving nutrition, and supporting the agricultural sector. In addition to the various government programs we just looked at, private sector and nonprofit initiatives play a crucial role in addressing food insecurity in the United States, often, fi often filling gaps and providing more localized, community-based solutions. Food banks collect, store, and distribute donated food to individuals and families in need, acting as intermediaries between food donors, like grocery stores, manufacturers, wholesalers, farmers, and so on, and local agencies, like soup kitchens and shelters, that directly serve people facing food insecurity. They also partner with federal programs like the Emergency Food Assistance Program. Feeding America is the largest networks of food banks in the U.S., partnering with over 200 member food banks nationwide. Other prominent food banks include the Second Harvest Food Bank Network and the Food Bank of New York City. Food pantries, on the other hand, distribute food directly to individuals and families in need. They're often operated by community organizations, religious institutions, or nonprofits. Pantries receive food from food banks, local donations, and sometimes purchase food themselves. Clients typically visit the pantry to pick up food, which can include non-perishable items and fresh produce. Soup kitchens provide prepared meals directly to those in need, often serving the homeless or very low-income individuals. They often operate in low-income neighborhoods or in areas with high homeless populations, aiming to provide immediate food relief to food-secure individuals. While we often think of these programs at the holidays, in practice they operate year-round, often relying on volunteer labor and donated food. The Salvation Army, Catholic Charities USA, and numerous smaller community-based organizations, for example, operate soup kitchens and meal programs across the country. And beyond that, other private initiatives include community gardens and urban farming initiatives, which promote local food production and community self-reliance, and often include educational components, teaching gardening and nutrition. Some CSAs offer subsidized shares for low-income individuals or donate a portion of their harvest. We explore these in greater detail in another video. Gleaning networks collect surplus crops from farms and gardens that would otherwise go to waste, distributing this fresh produce to food banks and other local agencies. Similarly, food recovery and redistribution organizations focus on reducing food waste by redirecting surplus food to those in need. Examples of this include the Food Recovery Network and ReFed. Meal delivery programs like Meals on Wheels provide prepared meals to homebound individuals, often seniors or those with disabilities. Many food companies donate excess inventory to food banks, and some have even established their own hunger relief initiatives. Examples include Walmart's Fight Hunger, Spark Change Campaign, and Feeding America's partnership with various corporations. Many local restaurants, grocers, and other similar businesses donate unsold, still edible food to local charities, including soup kitchens. We could go on and on. These initiatives often work in conjunction with government programs, sometimes receiving partial funding or support from public sources. As a result, they often tend to be more flexible and responsive to local needs than larger government programs. However, while these initiatives play a crucial role in addressing food insecurity, they face challenges like limited resources, reliance on volunteers, fluctuations in food donations, and difficulty reaching all those in need. As a result, they cannot fully replace government assistance programs and are not a substitute for addressing the root causes of poverty and food insecurity. Total government spending on food assistance programs is about $98 billion per year, with the vast majority of that being dedicated to the SNAP, WIC, and school meal programs. This sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but when we put it into perspective, it doesn't seem as large. That $98 billion spent on food assistance programs is about one-fifth of the $475 billion paid as interest on the national debt less than 12% of the $825 billion spent on Medicare annually, and about 11% of the $886 billion annual defense spending, and about 7% of the $1.4 trillion social security program. 
Despite this, food insecurity remains a major problem in the U.S. According to data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, about 12.8% of all households, about 44.2 million people, were food insecure at some point in 2022, meaning they were uncertain of having or unable to acquire enough food to meet the needs of all family members because they had insufficient money or other food resources. This figure includes 5.1 million households, representing about 3.8% of all U.S. households that were classified as having very low food security, where normal eating patterns were disrupted and food intake was reduced due to insufficient money or food. Food insecurity affects households with children at a higher rate, with 17.3% of such households being food insecure and 7.8% of those households having very low food security, a figure about twice the national average. Another way to think about that figure is that one in seven children in the United States live in food insecure households. Other demographic patterns also emerge. Black and Hispanic households experience food insecurity at higher rates than the national average, with 19.8% of black households and 16.2% of Hispanic households experiencing food insecurity, compared to just 7.9% of white households. Single-parent households, especially those headed by women, were more likely to be food insecure, with 27.7% of such households being food insecure. Approximately 7.3% of households with seniors, those aged 65 and older, were food insecure. As seniors often live on fixed incomes, they may struggle to afford nutritious foods impacting their health and quality of life. And not surprisingly, households with incomes below the poverty line are far more likely to be food insecure. Less than 2% of households with incomes above 185% of the federal poverty level are food insecure, compared to more than 12% of those with incomes below this level who are. There's also a geographic pattern to food insecurity, with households in southern states like Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Texas regularly experiencing higher levels of food insecurity than households in the rest of the country. Indeed, there's a wide range of variation in food security rates across the country. In 2022, for example, Arkansas had the highest rate of food insecurity in the country with 16.6% of all households experiencing some level of food insecurity, as shown by the orange bar, and 6.5% of households having very low food security, as shown by the blue bar. New Hampshire had the lowest incidence with just 6.2% of households experiencing food security and about 2.1% having very low food security in that state. Across the entire country, about 4.3% of all households had very low food security, while 11.2% of all households were food insecure. While both urban and rural areas experience food insecurity, the rate tends to be slightly higher in rural areas than in urban metro areas, 14.7% versus 12.5%. This is amplified by the fact that rural households often have more limited access to food assistance programs than urban households do. It's also worth noting that many food insecure individuals live in food deserts, areas with limited access to affordable and nutritious food. These are often characterized by lack of supermarkets and an abundance of fast food outlets and convenience stores. Food insecurity has real health and economic impacts. It is associated with higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, and heart Food insecurity has real health and economic impacts. It's associated with higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and obesity, and higher rates of depression and anxiety, leading to increased health expenditures for individuals and higher health care spending for society as a whole. Indeed, it's estimated that food insecurity costs the U.S. economy over $160 billion annually in health care costs alone. Hunger and malnutrition can lead to decreased cognitive function and productivity, impacting school and work performance and leading to increased absenteeism. Food insecure children often have lower academic achievement, potentially impacting future earning potentials. Further, it's well documented that hunger and malnutrition negatively impact children's physical and mental development, academic achievement, and overall well-being. Finally, food insecurity can trap poor families in a cycle of poverty by impacting health and educational outcomes. The current system of food and nutrition assistance in the United States has been subject to various critiques, controversies, and proposed reforms. Many argue that the benefits funded by programs like SNAP are not sufficient to meet basic nutritional needs of recipients, especially given the rising costs of food and living expenses. 
the Thrifty Food Plan, which is used to calculate SNAP benefits, is criticized for underestimating the true cost of a healthy diet, especially in the high cost of living areas in the country. The eligibility and application processes for food assistance programs can be complex and time-consuming, deterring eligible individuals from applying or maintaining benefits. Recipients also face a benefits cliff, where small increases in income can result in a significant reduction or loss in benefits, sometimes creating a disincentive to seek higher-paying jobs. Further, the stigma associated with using food assistance programs can deter participation, especially among those who may be eligible but feel shame or embarrassment. This is reinforced by widespread public misconceptions about food assistance programs, including a common misconception that recipients are lazy or abusing the system, which can lead to negative public perceptions and reduce popular support for these programs. There are also a variety of concerns raised about the quality of food provided under nutritional assistance programs. These critiques come from two directions. On the one hand, some argue that SNAP, WIC, and other programs permit the purchase of unhealthy processed foods or sugary drinks, contributing to obesity and diet-related diseases, which are disproportionately higher among low-income populations in the United States. On the other hand, critics argue that the canned and shelf-stable food provided under USDA commodity programs is unappetizing and unhealthy, with excessive levels of sodium, sugar, and preservatives, and a lack of fresh produce. There are also concerns about the administrative costs associated with running these programs and the potential for fraud or abuse. The existence of multiple programs with different eligibility criteria, benefits, and administrative processes can lead to confusion, overlap, and inefficiencies, and high administrative costs and complex program requirements can divert resources away from direct assistance to beneficiaries. That said, the documented level of fraud in food assistance programs is relatively low. According to an audit of the program, the total level of fraud in SNAP was approximately 1% of benefits. This is significantly lower than other major governmental programs like Medicare, the Earned Income Tax Credit, Unemployment Insurance, and others, where the fraud rate reaches 15% of benefits. These critiques have given rise to a variety of proposals for reforming and improving U.S. nutrition assistance programs. First, critics have argued that the funding and benefits level for nutrition assistance programs is inadequate to meet current demand and ensure food security for American households. As a result, they call for an increase to maximum SNAP benefits to better reflect the cost of a healthy diet and adjust for inflation regularly, and to expand the WIC food program to include a wider variety of nutritious foods and increase the cash value voucher for fruits and vegetables. Critics also call for the application and recertification process for food assistance programs to be simplified and streamlined to reduce administrative burdens and to make it easier for individuals to receive benefits. In some cases, as in the school breakfast and lunch programs, the call for universal eligibility, ensuring children have access to nutritious meals without stigma or bureaucratic hurdles, has been made. Critics call for greater public awareness campaigns to educate the public about the realities of food insecurity and the importance of food assistance programs and the integration of food assistance programs into other public health and social services in order to normalize its use and reduce stigma. In response to concerns over the quality of food delivered through the programs, critics have called for nutritional standards to be strengthened to promote healthier eating habits and better health outcomes, and to provide incentives for purchasing fresh fruits, vegetables, and other healthy foods through programs like SNAP. Finally, there have been a variety of proposals to streamline and modernize food assistance programs. Better integrating food assistance programs in community-based initiatives like farmers markets, community gardens, and urban farming to increase access to fresh produce in underserved areas, and to integrate food assistance programs with other social services to improve efficiency and reduce redundancy. Developing mobile markets and delivery systems to reach food insecure individuals in food deserts and rural areas, improving data sharing between programs to streamline services and ensure individuals receive all the assistance for which they're eligible. Updating legislation governing food assistance programs to reflect current economic conditions and nutritional science. Allowing states and localities more flexibility to pilot innovative approaches to reducing food insecurity and improving nutrition, and so on. Addressing the critiques and controversies in the current food and nutrition assistance programs in the United States requires a multifaceted approach that increases benefits adequacy, simplifies access, reduces stigma, improves nutritional quality, enhances coordination, and addresses food access issues. 
Through these reforms, critics argue, food assistance programs will be more effective in combating hunger and improving health outcomes for vulnerable populations. But that's it for now. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section below, and thanks for watching. Bye.